Today is much like yesterday at the heart of poor Victorian Glasgow. Street scenes with a tint of sepia. Old men pecking for a living on the fringe of the barrows. This grey square mile of the East End still comes alive each Saturday and Sunday. A squall of traders in carpets and curtains, fruit and veg, unpack the barrows market. They describe it as the biggest bargain basement in Europe. A fair, a market, an open-air meeting, all rolled into one. In alleyways where poverty and commerce, pride and affliction have made space for each other since the Industrial Revolution. For as long, the Salvation Army has unfurled the standard of decency over these streets from their oldest citadel in Scotland. uncomfortable reconciliation of God and Caesar, their purpose still sharpened in a city proud of its progress by a world hardly changed since the age of Dickens and the poorhouse. Now we're going to sing a song of testimony to you, and the words of the first verse say, Would you know why I love Jesus, why he is so dear to me? This is maybe the answer that you've been looking for. I've been seeking for him, and, but he never stayed come out. They gave me nothing. I was destitute and I went and I was walking by and I saw the salvation and I had to work. Hostel Glasgow, with its epidemic of homelessness. A life of sorts in model lodging houses like the oldest of them all, Moncur Street, where Jimmy Wallace has spent much of his adult life. Well, it's been a mess for quite a long time. But uh, what I've been told is, uh, with the cutbacks and that, they just can't afford the repairs. Well, it's really bad because in a really wet day, the water comes right through the roof. It comes down into the plaster and all that. The plaster is falling on top of it. People are living in the bunks. So you could be lying in bed, maybe during the night in a uh, heavy rain or that, and you could be lying in bed and the plaster would fall on the top of you. The submerged 10th, General Booth of the Salvation Army used to call them. At first, men from Ireland, from the Highlands and other more placid towns, come to find work in a city where the streets were paved with steel and iron. A drifting population that flowed back and forth across this end of Glasgow, but never drifted away. The heat of change elsewhere distilled the problems and the people here. They stayed, they still stay, making the best of a bad job or no job at all. We all look after one hundred, one hundred percent looking after one another, you know. You always get somebody else to give you a hand. 
I mean, I will not see anybody with that cup of tea or anything like that. And he, like I say, the older ones, we get them on. But after all, it doesn't matter what they are. They're still a human being. Barney was like that too until he became something of a symbol of hope on the hostel doorstep. He's settling into a home of his own, but he comes back to Moncur Street, to old haunts and his only friends. Excuse me, uh, James Wallace in here. Ah, he'll be shortly if you want to just go. I'll just get wait for a minute. But Barney's is a rare success. Most, like Jimmy, have the hostel's image of failure to live with. No job, no status to get a job, when 30 or 40 percent of the supposedly settled population are in the queue ahead of them. There's just the brew, Glasgow's euphemistic shrug for the dole. At weekends, Jimmy and those like him can't even have the streets. Their picture of failure clashes with the wallpaper, the hard sell of Mr. Barras. Right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's nice to see you again, and it's nice to see a nice full bus like this. Let me tell you something about some of the bargains in that place there, because I told you last week, and I'll tell you again, there are no bargains that way. There are only bargains that way. Anybody buy any junior football jerseys? Mm -hmm. Ever bought any? Yeah. Do you know they're selling them in there for 99 pence? <laughs> it's ridiculous. So go in there, get into your pockets, bring your friends and spend the money. OK? Good luck to you today and have a great day shopping. OK? And tell your friends to come again next week. What? Did you, did you bring your money with you? Wow, you're the thing we shot off. Get across the end door, but then. do you want the one? Two, three yards, four yards wide, a lot. Who wants it? 50 pence. You've got to let it sail. Is that not lovely? Is that not beautiful? And there you are, there's three yards, four okay, yards wide, a lot. 20 pence. Don't forget, 20 pence. Hands up the ladies who would take a pair of them for nothing. One, two, three. You, a right. woman's got her legs up. Just your hands up, darling. Right. You want a bag, I could sell it any. I don't care what it is, I'll sell. I bring this up here, it's sellable. Well, does all of it sell, though? I mean, a lot of the stuff oh, over there, frankly, looks like junk. Aye, it looks like it. Well, it seems to sell. I wouldn't tell these people our air is junk, you know, because <laughs> they'll all drop it and go, hey, <laughs> There you are, there am I tell you. Is that? It's the same punters every week, so it must be the same. I mean, they must be enjoy it, because it's the same punters. I know every one of their faces. Well, what do they do with the stuff when they've bought it from you? As I say, they take it here and that'll come in handy and it goes in the drawer. And uh, it lies in the drawer. I'll never ever come in handy. Maybe I'll buy ten parts, one part will come in handy, the other nine will come back here at some form of that. <laughs> Do you have a lot of pilfering here? Tons of yeah. They'll be at it now. I mean, it's. Uh, you're after called it rubbish, so what are you losing? <laughs> you'll notice all the good gears put in cases now, you know. You know, and she's got a scythe there and took the horns off of the catch, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm sure this won't trouble you one little bit. This will make a new woman of you. <laughs> Any pain? No discomfort? 
No, not at all. I'm quite comfortable. Good. Yes. Yeah, this won't trouble you either. Your nails are slightly thickened. This is the treatment the movie stars get. Just gives the finishing touches. It's a market full of East End promise. Today's equivalent of the Victorian patent medicine man and the travelling gypsy. Now, I want you to shuffle those up. Only the escapologists have gone. The Barrows is a cut-price grotto of wishful thinking. If the present is a problem, if the past is hardly worth remembering, then the future must be better. Husband, is he keeping well? Yes, I'm keeping well. Is he? I'm asking, is he? Uh, fairly well, yes. He's working very hard just now. Yes. He's getting tired. Yes. He's getting a pain in his arm. Sometimes, is he? 33. Well, he's a bit young for heart attacks, but I feel. There's a strain coming up here towards your husband. Oh, it's cut down his work. But when nothing works, when there are no more indulgences to sell, and when you strip away a further layer of Glasgow's prosperous veneer, there's another Glasgow population. These are the people on the underside of the welfare state, an uncomfortable memory. Men and women who long ago ceased to look for any sort of bargain, who swill away what little they have in a damp, depressing barroom stall. In Glasgow, once the second city of empire, they don't like to dwell on the fact that they still have urban problems more in keeping with the days of the Raj than the age of the microchip. A decayed, condemned tenement within earshot of the Barrows hawkers is what passes for the home of Bill Sanderson. I've been in hospital three times. I've been to the council alcoholism. I've been in the clinic for alcoholism. It's still, it's one of those things, eh? it's uncontrollable. Aye. What sort of trouble do you have in the clothes here, then? Alcoholics and people come up with girlfriends and... I have them all in the clothes. Just get the clock the stairs at night. So that's the prostitutes in here and the alcoholics? And the alcoholics, it's out of order. Man. You can't get peace at all. Doing a bed at night, they're kicking the door to get in. Shouting and bawling. How long have you been in this flat, Bill? Fortney, eh... Uh, I took him down here because my house got set up the stairs with fire. Set up the stairs, just putting fire with vandals. And you, you lived up above here before? I lived up above here for about 14 months, 15 months. Well, what sort of services do you have in this place? Nothing. None at all. You've just got to fend for yourself. Electricity? None. Water? Gas? None. No toilet facilities. Not even any toilet facilities? No toilet facilities. Because the place is a diabolical condition. So, it's out of order, you know. It's... Well, how much of the flat do you use, Bill? I just use a living room. This is through here, is it? Yes. Uh, you actually hear bits dropping off the walls at night. You lie in your bed. If you went blown at all, there's chunks of brick falling down. And... You can actually hear bits falling off the building? That's where you fall off the building, eh? You lie in your bed at night, you get it all falling down the walls. And... Oh, well, even this room, even this room doesn't look terribly, terribly safe, does it? I mean, it's... This is the best room of the house, actually, you know, it's... You're living in this place. You're the only person in this building, aren't you? Just my wife and I, it's in this building now. 
All the rest of the, the flats are empty. They're all, all empty. They're all loaded up, but you can't just sign all day. But, but how do you manage in a place like this when you've got no electricity, no toilet facilities? Use the toilets down the stairs or go to the one of the bars for the toilet. Or, but we're out all day anyway, you know. We just come in, have a smoke a cigarette and go to our bed, you know. It's just to the morning again. That's all you can do. So I was off it for a long while. Yeah. Went back on to it again. The past 15 months have just been pure. Pure murder, you know. Had to do something. And during those bad days, how, how many... How many hours a day were you drinking? Yeah, say about sometimes eight, nine in the morning to eleven at night. After eleven, I seen it go down to two and three in the morning, waking up and starting again. That's why I've been going for the past fifteen months. It's... How much a week was that costing you? I can reason about two hundred pound. Do you mind me asking how you managed to get two hundred pounds together to, to buy the drink? Well, there's ways and means. Ways and means. Uh, and what do you drink? I could drink anything, you know, wine, Calibre Specials, cider. Just had to get a cure in the morning, ready to shake, you know. I'm just glad I managed to get back over again. Oh, so in the morning, you had to have another drink to stop yourself shaking from yesterday's drink? Yes, that's the general idea. Then eating stopped. Stopped eating. Then. Is this yourself and your wife? Are you both? The both of both us were the same, you know. You've been off the drink now for a few days, haven't you? That's five days I'm off it now. Has it been a bad five days? Bad five nights. You go to bed at night, you see faces coming out the one, things like that. You can't sleep. It's you're actually you're actually hallucinating. You see, you're hallucinating. You're that like used to going to sleep with a good drink. You, it's like a sleeping pill. You used to sleeping pills. You can't sleep without them. Same if you can't sleep without drink. You try to improve yourself. You can't improve yourself in a place like this. You only look you're down worse. That's how we take off the drink. The drink will back up. When you reach your personal gutter. I think this is my personal gutter. The personal gutter for many is the bar at the bottom of the slide, the Mecca. You're busy tonight. Have you had your supplies in? All the supplies. There's never any problem with supplies. Have you phoned the tell? Yes, I've got that. And we are succumbing. Um, I said I needed him like. The uh, desert needs water. Well, and, <laughs> and, and the customers need a lot of man in the desert. Yeah. That's right. The customers are not so bad at all. <laughs> This is lunchtime in a 19th century underworld in the 1980s. The domain of mine host, Paul Byrne. It's a historical problem in the city here in that uh, over the last many decades, in fact, going back to, I suppose, the early days of the Industrial Revolution, this part of Glasgow, which is geographically and, in fact, technically, the centre of the city, I mean, every street was numbered from Glasgow Cross. Um, Traditionally, it was the, the working class area of, this, of the city. This is where the merchants made their money while they lived in the, in the west end of the city. And because of that, of course, it's, it's always had this working class label. And also because of that, in the days of workhouses, early days of workhouses, early days of, of model lodging houses, the concentration naturally was where the people who appeared to the province were. And in fact, these are real Glasgow people. And whatever pub they drink in this area is part of their day-to-day -day lives, and you get to know them on that basis. A lot of people find it cheaper to come out and sup a couple of pints night in the morning or all afternoon, merely because it's cheaper to do that than it is to heat their own house and use their own light or watch the television or be entertained and meet their friends. And life's difficult enough without having a drink problem. And when you have a drink problem, it's impossible. How would you respond to someone who levelled the criticism that you're somewhere exploiting people who have a drink problem? All right, well, I think that's nonsense. I don't think, I don't think anybody can be in whatever trade it's like saying that uh, chemists exploit people who are sick because they sell drugs. Um, uh, if a person has a, uh, has a drink problem, whether I sell it to him or whether it's Joe Bloggs sells it to him, that individual, because of the nature of the disease of alcoholism, will get alcohol in some form or another. At least it's controlled to some extent in here. How can I do it? I think that the only way that any of us can rest finally is resting in God. This is what I've been trying to say. Who, who is going to be? Is it me? 
Is it me? You. To me, myself, I think I'm, I'm cool. To hell with that. I know I'm, I know myself. I've got to get up at the end of the night. for nothing here, no charge, no charge, come in, but no charge, no charge, what a bag Tell you of something that money cannot buy, and that is Jesus Christ as a living saviour. And the gospel that we preach this afternoon is for the whosoever, class or creed or colour, does not come into it, the gospel is for you. Salvation Army has done for a century. Facing the problems as they are, where they are, is what the council is trying now, in an old rent office in the East End. Really, here is going to be an entry door into a whole network of services. It's, it's not just about dealing with the drink problem, it's going to be dealing with the marital problems, all the problems we're so familiar with, unfortunately, in the social work department, the debt, the arrears, the eviction, uh, child problems. Uh, so it's it's a problem that seeped through Glasgow from before the days of the social worker, a tradition that weighs heavily on the present social services chairman, Albert Long. I can recollect uh, in my early days where it was considered uh, an embarrassment to marry a man who didn't take a drink. And many young women uh, were known to state categorically that a man who didn't take a drink wasn't a man, simply because the man she's married to becomes a human being as a result of alcohol abuse at the weekend. He becomes the father, becomes the parent, the benefactor, he even becomes a lover at the weekends. And so the moronic figure disappears immediately. Money is available and there's a relaxation within the family. I would put it down as a major contributory factor in the social problem. The number of child, children in care, for example, is higher than any other region throughout Great Britain. Uh, the marital breakdown is, is, is something that's got to be seen to be believed. Uh, the, the, the violence, the violence that takes place, and I've often said that Glasgow and Strathclyde must be the most law-abiding part of the country for uh, four nights of the week. 
and on Friday and Saturday night, there seems to be a cultural approach to drinking which creates unbelievable problems for the police, the health services and the social work department. This new outspoken approach, Glasgow warts and all, no longer hidden under a sticking plaster of civic pride, is beginning to find results. The homeless are offered more than a wired cubicle and a mug of tea. Men like Barney are helped off the roundabout of hostel places by local authority homemakers like Mary Fury. We are that's what we're there for, to sort of make them independent. You know, they've been such a long time in a hostel, maybe 15, 20 years. And everything's changed since then. Oh, no. Who do you? No, I better not, I see. That's right. 195. Right, that's nice. And we try to get them into the community, but there's quite a majority of them just want to be left alone. And I feel it's the frighten in case other people would find out where they've came from. I'm a bit ashamed that they've come from a hostel. Mm -hmm. That's quite nice. You can go around to some other shops now, ah, okay? I'm in the corner here. Mm -hmm. I think there's something in the corner here. We asked at the hostel, do they want to go into housing? The majority do want house. Right, what can I line on? Are you thinking of picking? Oh, God knows, Mary, I can tell you. And I think most of it is they've got their own door. And they can come in and out when they like. If they don't feel very well in the mornings or they're feeling tired, they can lie along in the morning. They can get up when they like. They can make a cup of tea when they like and eat when they like. I think this is mostly why they prefer their house rather than the hostel. Mm -hmm. What are you making? I thought it was mince. Oh, my. I'll give you a plate after. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very <laughs> good. That's quite nice, that cooker. Hey. Well, that's good. What does that do in there? And how are you coping in the house, me? For the hostel, is it? It's lonely right enough, but I mean, I usually go down to the hostel and meet all the pals, like, mm -hmm. you know. But they don't know where I stay, just a, a friend of mine knows where I stay. Mm -hmm. Jimmy Wallace, that's the only one that's ever been up here. So I don't want to have anybody up here, you know, if we drink on. That's right, you, you want to get away from the door, like, that's right. Know? Doing the fireplace up by me? Aye, aye, a couple of weeks ago, Mary. Well, when I'm skint, Mary, that's, that's what I do. Very good. Me and I just sit down, pass my time, think first. When Barney's skint, he paints his Glasgow on scraps of hardboard liberated from dustbins and demolition sites. It's a view from the bottom of the heap, a view of a city that still thinks of itself in grand terms. But Barney's world is rooted in the mill and mine tenements east of the High Street, in Bridgeton and Calton, where the sweat ran and the money was made. Now, out along the London Road, another class is making a home in the Calton, where once there were slums, there are now owner-occupiers. A small square on the redevelopment map has been improved. But where in all this did the old residents and the old problems of the Calton go? Have they simply been nudged a little further down the road to new slums, that perpetuate the divisions of House Edge and Jack Bellamy's Carlton childhood. Well, if you go back to about 1932 or 33, I live just where you can see those houses there. And it was all crumbling tenements. The whole place was just a mess. Uh, it was dominated largely by gangs. You know, we, there was the Billy Boys and the Sally Boys. Uh, there was nothing but Which fighting. one were you a member of? I was the Billy Boys. But I had my own little select group. Uh, which was a sort of, uh, you might say, ex experts within the, within the gang itself. But it, it was rough. It was really rough. There's no question about it. You had, to, you had to be able to stand up for yourself. But knowing the area as well as you did, what was your reaction when you heard that a property development company was going to build private housing on, on this site on the London Road? I thought it was absolutely mad. I couldn't see how they could possibly sell houses down here and express this view. And so I was sent down to have a look at it. We had the winos in the park here, and we had the prostitutes down on the road further down. There was a steady stream of cars all waiting down there for the girls. In the seven months since we've come here, the winos have completely disappeared. There's none now. They've just given up. Uh, the fact of our houses being here seems to have chased them away. We're told they've chased them down to the high court, down that area now, but they're certainly not here. Uh, this is just a fine park now. Yeah. 
<laughs> Strip away another layer, just on the other side of that fine park, and you can find yourself in a venal by the Clyde, in Paddy's Market, another step down from the Barrows. So is the poor end of this market, where mothers sort rags to clothe their children, and old women sell bicycle wheels and plastic carrier bags, the bottom level. Perhaps it is, but the pressures of today's poverty are forcing what standards of living there are here still lower. Benefit, help from the state, is seen in a different, greyer light. The wedge of a new recession is widening the gap that yawns between political theory and the realities of this other city. You're not selling much today. Are you, are you not selling much today? No, I only get enough 50 pence that he put the bag. <laughs> That's all good, 50 pence. They can put it in the heart any time. <laughs> <laughs> How much do you make in a good day? Hey, well, for me not having a stall, I generally make a couple of pounds. And Saturday I made it four pounds. Was that a good day? Well, it was a Sunday dinner. Ah, uh, it was a good day. Wednesday and Saturday, and you'd just come down, you know, twice. Have you got stuff on you today that you're selling? I've got pens here and cassettes. Well, they're new, they're still in the box. Oh, still new. Where do they all come from? I say they're all stolen. I thought it was all stolen. I think everyone's so. I can buy them myself cheaper than I sell them for. So I make a profit. Do you not have bother with the police, though? No, no, no. You see, be it. No, no. But don't bother now. Very certainly come down now. Have you ever had a job, Joe? Never. No way. Never. 35 years. Never worked. I beat my father's record. He's 45 years. Your father didn't work for 45 years? No, beat his record. I'll hope so if I love one enough. <laughs> well, my husband brought me down here first, you see. He says, I'll take you into the Paddy's Market, he said. I said, where's that? Oh, he said, I'll soon show you. Well, I've been coming in the night ever since. How many days a week do you sell things down here, then? Well, I used to sell, but I'm not selling at all. What I come down for now, you see, is to meet my friends, my pals. There were hawkers, you see. And then there were, now I live alone, you see, now. Well, I like to come down there now to keep my mind occupied. When you were selling, how much could you make on a good day down here? Well, I've seen me going away with three or four pounds, but that was a lucky day, that. And on a bad day? Nothing sometimes. Which some of them here? That's all they earn sometimes. Nothing. So nothing. If it's wet or anything like that, you know, it's got to go empty-handed. Many of families clothed their children down here, especially during the war, which I can well remember. Clothing coupons you needed, didn't you? Well, they used to come down and get clothes, you see. Well, they're clothing coupons. That's how it was done, That's it. Do you think that the Marcus will keep on going? Well, it's been rumoured they're going to take it down, but I don't see how they can. I mean, they can't move that bridge, because that's for rolling stock. So that will never be moved. They had to stay. Hasn't changed a lot? Not at all, no. No. It'll be busier when years gone by, wouldn't it? No, I don't think so, Mary. Yeah, Not much a bit the same. Years gone by, years gone by. You used to think it was busier, did you? I thought it was busier was? in years gone by. Was it? Because you were here probably before me. You since I've seen the police coming through here with their police van. I'm going back over 30 years now. Gathering all the stuff out into the back of the police van and taking it away and giving it to the Salvation Army. And I've seen them carried out of here in the police van for standing here because they didn't have any street license. Hawker's license. But that's all finished now. I don't do that now. I don't do that. How's the coat? I'll give you a scarf, probably the colour. That's a jersey. Yeah, there you are, Pepe. There you are, sir. There you are. Okay, then. I'll see you. You said you came to jail yet? Don't know what I'm saying. Yes. Keep moving. 
Kine ci iasă mie înțeleg. It's the end of the day, a day much like yesterday, much like 50 or even 100 years ago for the people in Paddy's and some round the Barrows markets. When the last rags have been picked over and the last stalls have been packed away, men like Jimmy have the streets to themselves again. The doorways fill up. Little groups huddle round the dustbins. A mile away to the west, at the end of what used to be a short carriage ride for the factory owners, it's Saturday night in a proud and affluent green city. 